Okay, thanks. For, I know that people are still going to drift in the lunch, but, but we will start, otherwise we'll just get progressively behind. Um, so the next session is a student panel, and even though we've got all the chairs sitting out there, we're going to let the students stay where they are at the moment, uh, because otherwise they'll just be jumping up and down, or they'll get a, a bad neck looking up at the screen. Um, and we'll, as with the staff panel, we'll go through each of the presentations in turn, and then there'll be time for questions at the end. Um, so we'll begin with Ella Carling, who's a USP Foundation student. Thank you, Ella. Thank you, Professor Call. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm going to be speaking on the topic, the importance of integrating the arts in academic learning. So I'll just briefly describe what I'm going to talk about today. Firstly, I'll give a, an overview of the skills that arts can nurture. And then I will be speaking from a personal experience. And lastly, I'll discuss the importance of these skills to academic learning and future employment opportunities. So before I begin, I'd like to clarify what are the arts? And put simply, the arts are the expression or application of human creative skill and imagination, typically in a visual form. And for this presentation, I will be focusing on three specific art forms, these being dance, the visual arts, and music. Okay, so let's talk about dance. First and foremost, Dance keeps the body and brain active, improves fitness, and keeps muscle joints healthy, and releases physical and psychological stress, which is very important, especially for someone such as a student. So all these benefit you and your learning experience physically, but how does dance benefit academic learning? Firstly, dance develops independent thinking skills which is the ability to make sense of things based on your own experiences and observations. This is a tool that can be used to enhance personal expression and creative ability, and it propels an individual's performance and success. Dance also teaches self-confidence, which has been shown to result in better performance and greater overall success. Another benefit of dance is social development, which brings about great communication skills and better relationships. Social development also advances career prospects as an individual who has good people skills and the ability to interact and influence is more sought after in terms of employability. Finally, dance also teaches the three aspects of creative thinking, these being fluency, which is the ability to look at ideas from different perspectives and, improve, and improvise accordingly. Secondly, originality, which is self-explanatory. And lastly, abstractness, which is being able to think about an idea more deeply and richly or capture the essence of the information involved. Right, so moving on to visual arts. The visual arts or fine arts, when integrated into curriculum, have been found to improve self-regulatory -regu skills such as perseverance, problem solving, attentiveness, self-initiating, risk-taking, cooperation, and using feedback, which not only benefit academic learning, in my belief, but also contribute to entrepreneurial mindness. Participation in visual arts also encourages a positive, cohesive atmosphere, engagement and attendance, and personal and social developments. Additionally, visual arts provides a concrete metacognitive marking point, that is, the active control over the thinking processes engaged in learning, like planning, comprehending, and evaluating. Next, I'll talk about music, specifically instrument training and performance, which improves 
reading and comprehension skills, mathematical proficiency, spatial reasoning, self-efficacy, memory capacity, concentration, listening skills, discipline and patience, self-esteem, and social skills. Furthermore, various meta-analysis studies based on large bodies of research over the last few decades reveal consistently strong positive relationships between music and learning in other subject areas. Now I'll be talking from my own personal experience, which is with dance. My passion for dance started at a young age and blossomed as I did dance classes as extra activities. When I began my formal education at Yatsen Primary School, I was introduced to the wonderful world of cultural Chinese dancing, which gained fruition when I joined the Chinese Youth Social and Cultural Association when I was in secondary, as you can see in the second picture. After that, I did two years of ballet training before I joined the Vaux School of Dance here in Suva and began training in contemporary dance. At the end of last year, I joined the core group of Vaux and I now train and perform with that group on a regular basis and it's what I like to consider my job. Throughout school, I was said to be a confident, creative, sociable, and sometimes over-enthusiastic child. Personally, dance has taught me positive self-perception, self-expression, teamwork skills, critical and creative thinking, good time management and organization skills, and perseverance. Through dance, I've had the opportunity to travel, network, and further my learning in, in the different genres of dance which has undoubt undoubtedly opened my mind to the world, enriched my cultural identity, and benefited my academic education in many, many ways. So with all that being said, why integrate the arts into academic learning? The arts enhance and enrich learning far beyond what can be taught through standard academic learning. It also caters to the less academically inclined, that is, the arts support academic achievement by continuing a creative outlet that increases appeal and understanding of a subject. As Dr. Gardner discussed this morning, we need to encourage multidisciplinary studies and, the in and integration in order to create classrooms without walls. And by integrating the arts, we are not only doing this, but we are also opening up a whole new plethora of opportunities to individuals involved that would otherwise not have occurred. By integrating the arts, we are also developing the creative industry. By training and educating individuals who may not only add to the industry, but moreover increase the credibility of the industry itself as currently the arts industry is not held in very high professional regard. And of course, as I've discussed, the arts develop entrepreneurial mindedness and graduate employability, which has become vital in modern day society as Dr. Gardner talked about in his presentation. To close, I'd like to leave you all with a quote from the book Learning In and through the arts curriculum implications, which I think sums up my presentation perfectly. It goes, if the arts help define our path to the future, they need to become curriculum partners with other subject disciplines in ways that will allow them to contribute their own distinctive richness and com complexity to the learning process as a whole. Thank you. Very good afternoon and Bulvernaka to all of you. I must first of all take this opportunity to thank the Vice Chancellor, the Deputy Vice Chancellor and the University for creating a forum where students such as ourselves can come 
and discuss issues unique to us and also to better the student life here at the university. My presentation this afternoon will focus on the transition of students from high school learning into the university life. But not basically on the transition, but rather on the distinction of the environment that they uh, encounter. Students coming into university expect something different from the university life compared to their high school learning. The transition is often the easiest process. However, although when they come here, the rush of coming here, they feel um, the, uh, they expect something different from the university. They plan their goals accordingly from high school experience. But when they come here, they find something different. University life contrasts with secondary school learning because there are no boundaries, uh, to say the least. I mean, high school life, there are regulations. There is uniformity with um, school uniforms and all. Here, freedom in itself is both a blessing and a curse. And at times, the problem does not lie within the freedom that we are given, but how we handle that freedom. As a first year student, I asked um, uh, first years such as myself what they thought were their talents. And these were what they had given me. First of all, personal attributes. Now most of you would debate this fact if it's a talent or a skill, or is it a character of the person. Time management also came into play. And I believe this is a very good talent when one speaks of university learning. Because at times, as I've said, freedom is both blessing and a curse. And to manage time is to manage self. And if we are able to manage ourselves, learning will be a better process. Also, focus and innovation is, uh, a require, is, is a talent that students, our first years, have uh, come forth with. Self-determination, knowledge of self-worth, a positive perception, and a moral compass. I would like to focus on a positive perception in the sense of uh, learning. At times when students become depressed, their learning uh, adaptability is affected. And in this case, our attitude determines our altitude. And if our learning perception is positive, our learning results will be positive as well. When students come to the university, they expect something different. They have their own viewpoints of what they expect. But these are the challenges that they face. And this is the reality of university life from their perspective. Peer pressure, freedom, self-pity and depression, narrow-mindedness, a lack of self-worth and negative outlook for their social perspective, from their social perspectives. From academia, acad archaic education systems, discriminations and non-interactive teachers were some of the things that they've listed. But I'm glad that the University of the South Pacific is not included in the academic uh, perspective of the challenges that we face as first years. <laughs> with, with that being said, from personal experience, I am thankful for the lecturers that I've had uh, who have taught me to be more practical in what I've learned. Not only to acquire the knowledge, but actually apply it. Finally, I'd like to conclude with this. What I need as a first year. I've asked my fellow students, for well, first years as well, what do they require from the university? And this is what they gave me. Innovative education systems and teachers, which is already checked in the University of the South Pacific's characteristics. Practical engagements in interactive constructs. A good example is uh, from my high school life in Maris Brothers High School, where we have a program in Form 5 called Education for Life, where students are actually told to go out for a week into the workforce to experience the workforce. And it has only edified our learning. It, not, it has not only edified our learning, but it has also given us an experience, a backbone, if one should say. Also, the exposure to the realities of the workforce, as Dr. Phil Gardner had stated. What do they look for? Most of the times, students often ask the questions the wrong way. 
it is often asked, what can I give them and what they can do for me? But now we should be asking, what do the workforce want and how I can adapt myself to what they want? And then we have enrichment through technology and other resources, Moodle being one of them, which has allowed students all over the Pacific to access learning and resources that they could not have done decades ago. Finally, empowerment. The world is our oyster, is profound in its own way, but more so for a first year student. I thank you and I would like to conclude with that. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Felix Parker. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the university for allowing me to come and do a short presentation talk. I think so. My colleague there has uh, stolen one of my ideas. <laughs> but in all, uh, we're here to enforce the idea that uh, I'm going to be putting forward now. Oh, sorry. Okay, my, my topic today is about practicality. Uh, my good uh, friend here has uh, mentioned about something about experience. Um, in yesterday, uh, the two days uh, leading to today, um, I was present in a meeting that um, had this uh, lot of uh, uh, trying to come up with an, a system that will include students to have a bit of knowledge on practicality. And for me today, I know I've written a lot of things, and uh, for me to understand it more better, for, let, for you to understand it more better, there's a lot of different types of skills that is available in the system. And uh, to identify that, if you look at the picture I have put forward, some of these skills, uh, like traits that we need to get our students to understand more clearly, I believe uh, the debate is about our attributes and how do we measure that? And um, that is one of the things that I saw that was lacking you know, within the students, with us students. Eh? Preparing students for future challenges. This is uh, the area that I felt um, before entering the university uh, I assume that students will most probably have certain basic skills. But how do we get, you know, how, how is this skill measured in the university? Um, I have a son, you know, I was telling professor, I had a son um, that is also in the university, you know, and uh, the saddest thing, because at home we don't really understand how we measure our children's uh, capabilities until we really see it through the measurement of education, through the, the examinations. But, you know, the, the, the concern issue here for me is how do we as, the, the, as students adapt to the system that is in play? And um, the fear that we have among, you know, expressing ourselves, the fear of uh, letting, empowering, you know, students to stand up and say what they want. In the university is still, I see it's still a culture where there's a no, yes and don't. There's a culture there. So I believe this needs to change. For students to be adapted you know, into the system, we need to embrace that students are here to get whatever knowledge that is given to us. Okay, I did a bit of statistics uh, about uh, how, uh, what you call this, the, the, um, the statistic is taken on 200 level because I believe 200 level students do have to, you know, they do change courses halfway within the, their time of uh, study here. So I just took a three year complete uh, 
um, evaluation on that and found out that there's a certain percentage when they enroll. See, for example, there's an increase slightly in all the different years. So in, 2000, in the 2012, there's a 2,725. Then the, there's a slight increase here, and then a slight increase in the number of students enrolling. But my greatest concern is the next slide. It's the dropouts. The dropouts from different programs. Because these are the ones that we really need to nurture. This is where the issue lies with our students. Because if we do not solve this problem now, our future will be bleak. So I have a bit of some solutions and some ideas that... Uh, Okay, this is the reasons for dropouts. I think so my colleague did share. I'll just move forward. Solutions are here. We have the, the, the SLS system, the student learning. There is practicality within the system. The student learning support. Students are doing peer mentoring. Students themselves are doing that. Um, workshops are organized for us to develop our different skills that we, we are lacking. But I believe that the problem lies that there's lack of communication. Lack, lack of adv uh, advocacy to it, towards the system that we have in play. Uh, organizing debates, those are skills that students already have. So hopefully we can enhance this in the future so that the students can better understand. And so this is the other, the career hub. This is one of the areas that I think so that students too don't understand it's there, the career hub, where they career advising, the, the job, uh, which is assisting with improving CVs, preparing students for job interviews. These things are there, but the students don't understand it's there. So, we now, uh, now I'll ask if you have any questions for me, but I'll do that later. But this is what I'll conclude with. Uh, great player. Um, I, I had a bit of debate of putting this thing because my wife didn't agree with that, but it's my view. <laughs> So I've missed more than 900 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games 26 times. I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over, over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. So to leave with you, I'd like to acknowledge the great people that have put this uh, slide with me, um, the different faculties and my great wife. Thank you. I don't get to use the remote key. You can just click on it. Right, okay. What, what's the magic button? <laughs> or is it like a back and forth? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm going to raise it here now. Sweet. Wait, what's the laser? Oh, okay. Hi. Um, can I walk around with it? And how do I take this out? I am so sorry. I'm horrible at this stuff. Hi. Sorry for wasting the 30 seconds that I had with that. Um, First of all, uh, to the members who are here, uh, Dr. Cole and um, you know, Dr. Gardner up there, um, members of the USP staff and the student body, and for those who are outside the university for being here today, thank you for coming. First of all, hi. Uh, my name is, is it up there? No? Oh, yes. Hi. My name is Dwayne, even though it says Emmanuel Dwayne Mar. I don't really encourage Emmanuel because it's long-winded. It, it's Christian. It's, it's Celtic and stuff. That's great, but I prefer Dwayne. Um, I'm the year three student representative on this panel, and I am having to speak to you today uh, on this topic, eh? right. nurturing talent for today and tomorrow, it'll take everyone. However, it's really hard for me because all the speakers who came before have pretty much rendered me completely irrelevant. But I will do my best. Thank you. Um, right. Um, my, my topic today, the one that I'll talk about, will pretty, be, pretty much be um, journey through USP as a student. Because I'm a third year, uh, I've been through the program, I went through the first year, I went through the second, and the first year was, uh... yes, and I went through third year as well. All right, so everyone at some point in time, when you come to university, you've been through primary school, you've been through high school, you are conditioned to a particular style, right? where you go in, you learn your things on a daily basis, the teacher is there to teach you, they will scold you if you're trying to run away from your work, and they'll make sure that you get back 
on the, on the path to you know, getting to your exam, making sure you pass. Right? Now, however, as a result, it puts you in a certain mindset where you can just cram at the end of the term and you know, do your exam, pass through, and you're good to go. And then you enter university. And uh, I believe uh, Israel mentioned it uh, very well, that the transition there, it's, it, can be, it can be an absolute shocker for a lot of people. I use the term culture shock, and that term tends to be used a lot. But it is true. Uh, as a first year student, I, I'll, I'm not going to lie to any one of you, I, I was hit really hard in my first year. I came from high school, top, of, top graduate geography of, of my year, Form 7. I came in here and I damn near flunked my first semester. Because the, the ideology that I was used to didn't work. You have to change when you're here. You have to adapt. There are skills here that this place teaches you that you can't get at the primary and high school levels. We can all agree on that, correct? Yeah. Anyone can disagree with that? No. Right? So, you know, when you're asking the question, what is the relevance of a university? I'll tell you what the relevance is. The university is what's supposed to prepare you for what's out there. The unfortunate reality is, and this is a wake-up call for a lot of students, the real world is not as forgiving as, a, as an educational institute. It really isn't. You get one shot. You get one shot and that's it. So, you know, I, I came in here, I, I came from a multicultural school, right? Yet, when I came here, I met people from all walks of life. Solomon Islanders, people from Vanuatu, Kiribati, Tuvalu, you name it, I met them. And I loved it. That's what I loved about this university. You know, um, just, was it just last week? Um, the, the president of the Asian Development Bank was here. He said USP is the, was the first ever regional-based institute for university teaching. He's not wrong. You can see people from all walks of life here in one place at the same time, and they each come with their different backgrounds, their different experiences. Hell, the accents alone is a wonder every day. <laughs> but as Israel put it, there are times when you struggle and when you do you can fall. From there, and, this is, and it usually occurs in your foundation year, if not your first year. You will make your mistakes, and very often people will fall. But from there, it's up to you. You decide. Do you get back up and continue on that same path? Or do you get up and you choose an alternative route? At the end of the day, you have to aim for what it is that you want to become. You have to aim for the future end goal. But there's, it's not one lane to that end goal. There are multiple paths to it. But you have to decide. You have to get up, you have to look deep. You have to look inside yourself, and you have to decide, am I going to continue along this path, or am I going to choose an alternate route? I chose an alternate route. My first year, one of my two majors, I didn't like it. I just couldn't handle it, so I chose an alternative. I went from economics to journalism. My other one is geography. I stuck with that. And I'm quite, help, I'm quite happy about that. And I've never looked back. Journalism, while challenging and tough, it was, it was an absolute shocker, but the amount of freedom that they give you, the amount of freedom that they expect from you, they expect you to be innovative. Because you're a journalist, you are expected to know economics, you are expected to know social issues, you are expected to know everything. Because you have to talk to a lot of people. And geography I stuck with because I loved it. Why not? If you love something that much, why give up on it? If you have the drive to do it, by all means, do it. Second year is where you, is for me, was the time when I had a lot of practical skills put in. You know, I, I, did, a lot of, I did a lot of geoscience courses uh, with Dr. John Lowry. I believe he's sitting up in the crowd there. Hello, sir. Uh, he was one of the first to really to really believe in what I could do. When, when, when he would give a lecture, I could ask him a question straight up in front of the class, and instead of everyone going, ooh, he'll just answer me straight to my face. Open, honest, straight, one-to-one, -one, and it felt so engaging, it felt so encouraging. You want to talk about, you want to talk about people being innovative and lectures being entertaining? You know, answering a student one-to-one, man-to-man, woman-to-woman, Letting them know that they see you. 
that is as encouraging as it gets. Because you're not look, being looked down upon. You are being looked at as someone who has worth and value. And there is nothing more encouraging than that. I say that truly from the bottom of my heart. There is nothing more encouraging than that. I learned a lot of things while here, both from my time in geography. Geography took me to places I had never known existed within my own country, and I'm ashamed to say that. I didn't even know it existed. I went to villages left, right, and center. I met people at the grassroots level, and I had this preconceived notion about them because I was a city boy, and I've never been more ashamed. I was never more wrong. They are the most humble people out there. They took us in with open arms. They told us of their issues, their problems, their plights. You're able to see it through their eyes. So what did, what did journalism teach me? The ability to grasp the heart of the matter. There are a lot of issues that go on in the world out there, but narrowing it down, getting to the focal point, journalism taught me that. And I won't lie to you, it's been a rough road through journalism, yeah. There have been some ups and downs, sure. But I'd like to give uh, credit to another man, Dr. Shalendra Singh, who, you know, took in a, a guy who was just wading through there aimlessly and said, you can do better. I believe you can do more. And so I did more. I'm trying to do more. I'm trying to be more. Because the expectations that were given to me were ones that I didn't even have of myself. You want to talk about nurturing talent? Here's the thing. Most students don't even know that they have it. It's hard to see. It's always easier to be on the outside looking in. But when you're on the inside and someone tells you to look in the mirror, you can look in the mirror all you want. It doesn't mean you're going to see what other people see. It really doesn't. It's not that easy. And you can have people tell you, you can do this, you can do that. But it takes, it takes a, certain, a certain catalyst to actually make you believe that. I got to say, um, the... The things that I learned, the ability to, okay, I was an introvert. Thank you. I'm a bit of a geek person. I am a nerd. Just putting it out there. I, I gained the ability to speak through my time here. Now that I'm a third year, I'm a senior, I'm going to be leaving soon. But every opportunity I get, I've tried to speak to the younger ones coming through. And this is especially the case for journalism. We are a small knit group, and it's one of the few where a third year student can actually, on a day to day basis, talk to a second and first year student. That's, that is honestly how small in number and tight knit we are. So, what have I tried to do? I've tried to talk to the first years. Are you guys all right? Are you having problems? Look, I know it can be hard. No one ever said it was going to be easy. No one ever said that getting to the end goal, making it to the successful route, and the goal at the end was going to be easy. No one ever said that. It takes hard work, it takes determination. And sure, it takes a certain level of skill, fine. But you can have all the skill in the world, but without passion, it amounts to nothing. If you are not willing to put in the hours, put in the effort, then talent is wasted. I believe it was mentioned up there that, you know, um, hard work surpasses talent when talent no longer works hard. It's true. It is true. So, I've tried to, you know, you, you, try to, you, you try to talk to all the younger ones, you, you try to help them out. I love, I love the, the peer learning programs that they have here because students are shy people. At the same time, they're proud people, needlessly so sometimes. Like, they're so proud that they don't want to, you know, take part. Oh, no, this peer review, I don't want to see, be seen there. Uh, needlessly. But you, you understand that level of fear or that level of pride. It's, it's just a part of who they are, they're young, and they will always relate better to people who are like them, their peers. You'll always find that. Even when you're adults, you always relate better to your colleagues than you would your underlings. It's just a fact. So it is true that what Dr. What Dr. Cole said, that there are programs here at the university that students are not aware of. It is true, sir. And more often than not, you find that, that they that they don't take it up either because they just don't know it exists. Uh, that could be probably due to, as, as Felix said, either lack of advocacy or lack of advertising, whichever way we're going to put it. Or they do know it exists, but they're unsure if they're willing to take that step. They're unsure of what it means. But if you're going to say that um, 
if, if you're going to say that, that nurturing talent is something that, that takes everyone's input to develop, then the onus also has to fall back on the student's part as well. We can't just say, oh, it's, uh, you know, we can nurture talent, the university does this, the university does that. that. That's basically saying that nurturing talent is entirely the academia's role. It's not. It's not. It comes from many multiple factors. Right? It was mentioned earlier in an earlier presentation that it comes from, starts from the family, starts from home. Then you have your community, you know, then you come through school. I believe the students have an onus to themselves. They have a responsibility to each and every one of themselves to be the best they can be, and whatever lessons they learn along the way, no matter how painful they are, no matter how painful it was, no matter how shocking, no matter how scared you were, take all of that and pass on that experience. What I would have given, what I would have given in my first year to have a senior student talk to me and tell me, you're going to go through some really, really tough times, and you're going to go through some really hard times, but I promise you, if you work through it, you will make it to the end. Is there anything I can do to help you? Are you struggling with anything? What I would have given for that? I never got that, probably because I never knew it was there. Perhaps it wasn't, I don't know. But if I had it now, I would have taken it, for sure. As I was, the last slide, you know, university life is a journey. I went through year one, two, and three, and I'm here today, speaking in front of all of you. I learned a lot of skills, many of them practical, all of them important. Whether or not they're applied in the workforce, doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you learn them, which means that it's something that you have. It's a skill that you can take with you no matter where you go. Whether you apply it or not, doesn't matter. You've got it. And that's something that's invaluable. You can't get rid of that. And you can never downgrade or downvalue it. I believe it is for the, the duty of the senior students to look after their underclassmen coming up because they're going to face some very tough times. It cannot be the entire owner shoved onto the university, no. It's going to take everyone, everyone. So I'm going to conclude saying that this is the theme of today, nurturing talent for today and tomorrow. It will take everyone, and I truly believe that is the case. From me to you, thank you very much. and um, Dr. Gardner, thank you very much uh, also to the faculty for the opportunity today. Uh, my name is Maria Carling, I'm one of the alumni students and um, I've been working in the um, area of children and youth development for the last 15 years so I'm taking a different aspect to the theme around nurturing talent which is looking at the role of participation or youth participation in, in nurturing talent for active citizenship. So I'm going to first look at the relationship between participation and the development of potential or talent, if you like, and then look at how this is important to citizenship and national development. And it's loosely based on my master's thesis topic that I did here at USP, which explored how the principle of participation could be used to maximize the citizenship potential of young people in Fiji. And this was really in response to the fact that I knew that there were more than 35,000 young people who were unemployed in Fiji at the time. That's from the 2006 labor market survey. So there was obviously, um, we were not nurturing the potential that we needed. We were not uh, getting as much as we could from our citizens in the country. So I wanted to see how the principle of participation could, could address that. So, the principle of participation, it's well embedded in the human rights framework, um, in, in many conventions and declarations, and here's one as an example, the UN Declaration on the Right to Development. In Article 1 talks about every person and all peoples are entitled to participate in, contribute to, and enjoy economic, social, cultural, and political development. Another example in the Millennium Declaration, which is almost coming to an end, um, in Article 25, it reaffirms all of the participation principles in other treaties and talks about 
working collectively for more inclusive political processes, allowing genuine participation by all citizens in our communities. So there's no discrimination on age. It talks about all citizens. So that, that's everyone, including children and young people. And because there is no discrimination in age, the principle of participation is also in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Here in Article 12, it talks about the child having the right to express views freely in all matters affecting the child. Um, and it's also one of the four principles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. There's 54 articles, and if you can't remember all 54, just remember these four principles. These are what you need to understand when it comes to children's rights. And there, number four, the views of the child in Article 12 is there, right next to the right to life, survival, and development in Article 6. So it's given a lot of importance um, in, the term, in terms of the rights of children and, and in human rights. Again, it's uh, further elaborated on in Article 13, which is the freedom to expression. And we've heard this a lot. Um, the principle of participation is one of the principles that is less well uh, looked at in terms of development. We look at life survival and development, but we pay less attention to participation. And it's because it is so contentious. This freedom, which a lot of, gets a lot of people worried, talks about um, the child should have the right to freedom of expression. That includes freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, in any form or media of the child's choice. That does get a lot of people worried, the freedom to expression. People worry about children holding a revolution and being rude. But the second part of that Article 13 is what we call the responsibilities. It's where the rights have limitations or restrictions. And I just want to just put, pay a little bit of attention to this because it might calm us all down. The exercise of this right may be subject to certain restrictions uh, that are provided by law and are necessary for the respects and rights of reputations of others or for the protection of national security or public order or of public health or morals. So there are limitations. We can't go and do whatever we want. Children are not allowed to go and run riot. They have to have the freedom to express, but they need that freedom to start learning where the responsibilities lie. And so that's the second part of that article. So the principle of participation, well embedded in the human rights framework. Maybe it can be better understood when we talk about human development or child development um, or nurturing talent, as we're talking about today. Child development specialists generally agree around seven areas of child development or human development, and some of them are here. Educational development, physical development, emotional, social, mental, mental spiritual, cognitive, and so forth. Participation is an element of many of these kinds of development in children, but probably more um, specifically to emotional development and social development. And generally, researchers can see a, a consistent link between participation of a child and their overall well-being. Because it builds life skills, it builds confidence, it helps them realize their valid place in society and develop self-esteem, self-empowerment, you can see when you ask a child to contribute an answer and you, you give them feedback and say, well done, they, they feel empowered and they feel good. So this is how participation works. When we can develop these areas of our um, soft skills, I guess, we develop a greater capacity or talent to contribute to our community, our environment, and to our nation. The, the value of participation also can be seen bigger than just the, in what's in individuals. Um, the decisions that young people can contribute to development processes are also can lead to better decisions and better outcomes. Um, young people often have different perspectives to what adults assume. And when we leave them out of the room, we can actually arrive at a different or a wrong um, uh, decision at the end. Young people have more specific perceptions or perspectives than what adults generalize. And young people have more practical um, inputs and, and we uh, uh, can be less practical as adults. Through the process, young people, as I mentioned before, develop their capacity, develop them, themselves, their personal development. 
but it also builds a mutual respect between generations, the younger and the older generations. It builds peace and understanding and increases capacity all around, not just for young people, but for um, the elders and the adults as well. And just to highlight that example, this is a, a real uh, situation of when you ask development practitioners what issues are young people facing today, this is the kind of list that they will come up with, which is a long list of problems, unemployment, dropping out of school, youth substance abuse, etc. But when you ask the same question to young people, what are youth issues that young people are facing today, they have a completely different um, approach. So young people can bring a more positive approach to de development or decision making. They talk about they need um, skills training for youth capacity. They need greater access for information. They need active youth participation. It's a very different picture to that list of problems that we, we just saw. So the, the input is different, it's more practical, it's more positive. And it can also be, it's worth considering the consequences of denying participation. Uh, it's not just a matter of not doing it, there's actually a detrimental effect to leaving out participation or leaving out young people from the process. We can almost effect, render them silent or voiceless and that can have quite serious impacts on, on their ability to protect themselves from risk and exploitation. And when, when, they're not, when they don't have the opportunity to participate or develop those skills like self-esteem and confidence, they can become, they don't develop many skills that are needed for work, for jobs. And so it can lead to unemployment, underemployment, and continuing of that um, leading to de dependency and hardship and overall development burden. Just to highlight that, this is a, a chart um, of distribution of risk and vulnerability and down the left-hand side are, are factors that affect, that can affect our, our development. And along the top is the life cycle, pregnancy, when the mother's holding child, through if infancy, childhood, and through to adolescence and youth. Uh, for example, at the top is poor nutrition. And you can see that shaded blue area is, is highest at pregnancy. So if a mother carrying a child has poor nutrition, the risk to that child is highest. So just to highlight, the lack of information and participation to a child, you can see if you follow that row along, through childhood is fairly low because children have parents, they have teachers, they have families around them to represent or advocate for them. But come adolescence and youth, that risk all of a sudden jumps up. So young people become very vulnerable. Um, there's higher risk that they face if they haven't developed those skills that you develop through participation through childhood. So we have to start quite early on in childhood to give children the opportunity to participate in decision making so they can develop those skills. When you try and factor that into um, programming or development, there's several uh, factors that we need to consider. We need to make sure that representation is, is important. We don't need to, we shouldn't go to the, the ones who have the opportunity to speak, the elite, we need to make sure that we get a good representation across all young people. Uh, so we need to have structures in place, democratic structures, where we need young people to represent their own issues. For example, a young person with disabilities needs to be able to represent their issues, not somebody without disabilities. The opportunities need to be distributed as equitably as possible. They need to be sustainable opportunities, not the one-off conference or forum, they need to be institutionalized with mechanisms in, in, in place, for example, student unions that you have here at USP, um, and have ongoing participation that starts at home and is in schools and in communities. Participation needs to be meaningful, so not tokenistic. It needs to benefit the participants first and foremost, and it needs to influence the agenda, so it's not just a walk in and walk out. It has to have somewhere it goes. And of course, it has to happen with capacity building. It was spoken about this morning, um, the author who talked about um, the constitutional process and the need for civic education. Capacity building needs to happen for the participant and those who need to respond and listen to that as well. So there's, there's quite a lot that needs to be put in a system to be able to factor in participation. And my last slide, or second to last slide, 
um, is when you look at this at a governance level for a country, which is, this was related to my, my study, was that you need to have the, the capacity development of children and adolescents in place, which happens through the school system or school of families and communities, structures in place for young people to have their voices channeled through, legal mandated authority and accountability, so policies and laws, information systems so that leaders know what the situation of young people is, and a responsive leadership so that the leaders understand how to listen and how to respond. And then you start to have your level of youth development like, um, generated and your citizenship role maximized, leading to what we hope is a good political, social, and economic development impact. So it really will take everyone, as you can see, when just from this governance structure. It's, it's challenging because um, there's a lot to it. But I think one of our biggest challenges is, is our own attitudes and perceptions. And I just show this last quote, which is, um, youth today love luxury, they have bad manners, contempt for authority, no respect for older people, talk nonsense when they should work. Young people do not stand up any longer when adults enter the room. They contradict their parents, talk too much in company, guzzle their food, lay their legs on table, and tyrannize their elders. And we think that this is a contemporary quote, but this is actually from Socrates around 500 BC. It's a complaint about the young people in Athens. And I think that young people have always been youthful and adults always are a little bit dismissive of young people. And that really is one of our biggest challenges is to actually accept them as they are and let them participate. Thank you. Ave a year in the Yavan Noa Ote, Fatal of Form Fafelo Ayatuai, Ilausunga, Professor Richard Cole, Lausunga Ile, Suita Pawel University of Pacifica Saute, Lausunga Ile, Mano Fara Longia Polo of Young Foy, Dr. Gardiner, I myself, Paia Loa Loa, Lasilasi Mufai on Tato. Fatasi nei awa uli matengo fie talo falava ma lo le soifua taluai ona olea filongi al tato o te fatalo fatu fo ile tapo inga malu si o watunu upele o samoa yona tupu maona e I may say let up for Inga or not to pull Langa Lalovaoa. I may say for Tainani for let up for Inga, Matua Pelem Ainga. Fafetai tap what? On our left, feeling ill tattoo fat singer, I less so. Mafu Angalea, Olea Fanga in Island, Nana Pertania. Dr. Richard Cole, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Teaching and Learning. Professor uh, Dr. Gardiner from Michigan State University, and all distinguished lecturers and those who are present in the forum today. A very warm good afternoon to you all, all and talofa lava from Samoa. 
My name is Ari Hazelman, and I have been given the great privilege and honor to be the first student with disabilities to represent students with disabilities on this august student panel. Therefore, I extend my sincerest thanks to the Vice Chancellor and everyone who has made this occasion possible. Today, I will be talking on some issues that we students with disabilities face every day. But before that, I would like to have the participation of the audience as much as possible. Therefore, I would like to ask one of the audience to tell us what the theme is for the forum. Thank you. Time is going, so please hurry up. Nurturing talent for today and tomorrow, it takes everyone. And I've just confirmed that because that's what my talking laptop is telling me in my ear. <laughs> my first question is, do you think that the university is including everyone? Yes or no? Louder, please. Yes. I think so. You know why? Because I'm standing here today. <laughs> That's why. And my, sec my second question is, how can you nurture the talent for today and tomorrow if the proper infrastructure or systems are in place to enable that to happen. And this, these issues that I'll be talking about today will sort of give you a brief outline and show you how uh, systems can do that from a person with disabilities point of view. Firstly, you people may ask, what is a person with disability? What is a person with disability? So the IT guy, the slide should be going to that uh, second part. I do not know, uh, all up to you. Um, I will read from my braille copy of the, the part of the slide that I put. I took the definition from the convention, so that's reference, so no plagiarism. Um, so it says here in braille, Persons with disabilities include those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, which is, excuse me, which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. Oh, very long. <laughs> um, this simply means, from a, from a um, person with a disability's point of view, that the barriers, the main barrier, includes the environment itself where the person with disability is living in or the environment where the person with disability has to go through. That includes all sorts of systems in place and all sorts of restrictions that are put on in the system. And these systems do not take into account people with disabilities because you have to face the reality. The world is designed mostly for people 
for able-bodied people. Yes? Do you all agree? Yes. And I do not hold it against you because it is, it is a fact. It is a fact. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, so, so that's, the, that's the definition from, uh, from that, and I hope you, you realize. Because if those barriers are removed, there will be equal participation as uh, the lovely lady with the lovely crisp British accent has uh, talked on. Um, number three, the first point that I will talk on is course structure and um, online courses, including reasonable accommodation. Okay, can someone start reading from the word which is? I'm tired of reading, so someone from the audience can read. Thank you. Which is? Ooh, is that the Dean of Education? No? <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Kendrayate. Thank you very much for your wonderful... Um, <laughs> wonderful. I, I, I knew your voice from the first orientation we had last year. So, <laughs> yeah. I Thank you very much, Doctor, and I appreciate you um, actually coming down to our level and... Uh, and helping me with the with the work. Thank you so much. Um, yes. Yeah, so this uh, reasonable accommodation, which is so hard word and so much, you know, it, it means that you have to make certain adjustments. Adjustments that will take into account the disability of the person. Yes, of course. But it will also take into account the potential of the person. Yes. So, yes, we have some issues with your online courses, me, uh, Dr. Kendrayate. <laughs> um, <laughs> with, with all due respect, with all due respect, um, um, speaking as a person who is totally blind or visually impaired, um, the online courses have been very difficult due to the fact that uh, there's a less contact hours with teachers and knowing the fact that we cannot see so we need to hear yes we need to hear so our 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 first issue is that yes there, there's there's less contact with teachers and our second issue is that i'm from samoa and my parents is making me leave my lovely home and all my food that i eat every sunday and uh, forcing me to come here and telling me that Laudala has everything, everything, everything. You go to the library, you use the resources. We have the great Pacific collection. But the problem is all the materials are not accessible. So, yes, uh, that's the problem uh, with online course. And um, the third problem is that I think we should have uh, online course and face-to-face -face always has it as an option. Always. No buts about it, always. <laughs> because firstly, the governments will start reviewing. Why do they send their students all the way here? Why? Their students come and learn, their students come and go to field trips, their students come and, uh, and, uh, um, and interact with the lecturers who were teachers themselves and students themselves. Yes, but the current system, it seems like that we are just given the online task and just uh, do it and submit, and there's no, um, there's no nurturing there. You just uh, put out in the deep water, as they say. Uh, so, so that's the uh, issue. But uh, I, yes, I've tried to come up with some solutions with that, Dr. Kenrayate, please. Um, the solution is, uh, if, you, if the university is really um, considering moving to online, 
then perhaps the university could um, first of all uh, put, don't do away with lectures. A lot of students, they say, oh, I don't want to go to lecture, I don't want to go to lecture, I go Southern Cross, eat, eat, eat. <laughs> but uh, lectures are important because the teacher is telling you and explaining and gesturing, and which I can't see what the teacher is gesturing about. <laughs> but uh, yes, um, gesturing and all that and trying to show the slides and the pictures and the maps and everything and explaining. So if you do not want to have contact with your students, then perhaps you could put those lectures in audio format, MP3. You put that in audio format, you place it on the Moodle, and the best example I can give you is Dr. Margaret Mischer from UU200. She does that for her blended mode, and people do not need to go to lectures, they can just listen and, and go and, and, and debate, debate, debate. Um, <coughs> Uh, sorry. Secondly, um, uh, with online, um, for us blind people, it's very. Um, when uh, when I took my ED two five two, yes, ED two five two, um, they actually said for me to make friends online and go and form my own groups. But you, <laughs> but you, if you look. If you look at the logistics, a blind person cannot firstly see the participants with the... And what about if you go there and they're about to punch me and I'm not able to see them? So, yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the issues. Um, with regard to the audio lectures and any, um, any um, uh, videos that you put up in the online, uh, please, to my deaf friends, those who are hearing impaired, I have, I have not forgotten you, and I hope there's a sign language interpreter here interpreting. Um, for you, you always talk about captions, providing captions on YouTube videos that lecturers put up, or providing captions on, uh, on any sort of uh, video interface that the lecturers put up. And the lecturers will ask, how the hell are we going to do that? Excuse my vulgar language. but. Uh, since most of our students are located here in Laudala who are hearing impaired, I'm sure that can be easily done with uh, working together with the Deaf Association of Fiji and uh, with, with all the other interpreters. So say for example you want to you put such uh, captions on, you can just tell them to come and do the interpretation and they can do the video recording. After that post on the, on the Muru. Or if not, if, if the bandwidth is not, too, um, is not uh, good, then you just send it via DVD on the, on the mail, snail mail, and it'll get to the region, and the, and the people who are deaf can, uh, can, can use that. Yes? So, so that is uh, some, uh, some solutions that uh, I've come up with, and I hope that... Uh, we've, sorry, we've come up with, not me, with, we have come up with as a students with disabilities in the Disability Resource Center, which I also acknowledge and thank uh, uh, very gratefully for the wonderful work that, that uh, they have done. Okay, let me see if, if I finish with reasonable commendation. Okay, okay. Sorry, okay, that is, can someone read to me the, is it the, the fourth, the, the second point? Allow for, allow for more flexibility and time in doing what? In doing and handing in assignments. Well, I think everyone has that issue of time, 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 deadline, 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 submit, submit, submit. But in the, in the point of view of the person with disability, when they think of deadlines, you know what they think of? They think of all the things they are not able to do to, to do that assignment. That's the main... As soon as the, they see the due date, oh my gosh, how am I going to go and read all these books? Oh my gosh, how am I going to reference? Oh my gosh, how am I going to, to, to get all these resources? Because I can't even see, I can't even hear, I can't even walk, I can't even whatever, whatever, whatever. So... Um, the, the, the main point is it's not having an unfair advantage 
over the other students if we ask for extra time. And that extra time can be like one week extra or even one month extra. <laughs> but the, the main thing is so that it can give them time to go and get assistance to do the, um, to do the things, eh? to do the assignments, to get all the... Because realistically the... Yeah, well, yeah. So yeah, so yeah, just uh, that. And uh, while we are on assignments and referencing, this is also a good point for you online. I just remembered that it would be nice for people who are blind. They get they have very uh, great difficulty with um, actually doing referencing in the different styles. Because realistically, the, the referencing styles are for, uh, designed for sighted persons. The bolding, the italics, the, all the different punctuations have to be put in this place, that place, that place. But realistically, we, we do not even see the layout. Okay? So the solution, Dr. Kendrayate, don't worry, will be, will be that um, I've asked uh, SLS if they could kindly uh, make audio recordings with clear and concise explanations on first of all what is what is the difference between bolding and italize why do we have bolding and italize secondly the the different punctuation placements where do you put this where do you put that the comma comes after what the full stop comes after what the semicolon comes after what what is semicolon what is comma because some of these things we, we as, as uh, people who are visually impaired or blind people can only stop at, I think, uh, comma, full stop. Yeah, comma, full stop and capital, most of us. All the other things like semicolon and bold and all that, we, we, when we read Braille here, this is Braille. When we, when we, we have a sign for bold, but it doesn't mean that the Braille dots will expand like this and go... No, no, that, that, is, that is for print uh, sighted persons with all due respect to you so that they can see that the headline is bigger or the, they can get their attention. So yes, that's what I've told and, and unfortunately they told me that they're short staffed uh, but hopefully that can be done in time and that's called progressive realization and as time it goes on, um, people will start to progress and realize that, uh, that it's an investment. Okay. I think I'm about to finish because according to uh, Yvonne, I'm the shortest presentation out of all the group. Eh? Uh, okay. Can someone, another person from the audience read the last point? Thank you, Hilda. Very nice to hear you, Hilda. Um, um, read again, Hilda, please. <laughs> Having scholarships for students with disabilities plus allowances, yes? Okay. Um, from what I've been told, Fiji is the only member of the 12 member countries of USP that has a, uh, disability, a scholarship for students with disabilities. Hmm. I don't know if that's true. But uh, it makes me really sad as a Samoan and as also a Pacific Islander with a disability. I, I totally understand that we are in early days and we are doing baby steps and all that. But given the fact that there are very few of us who can make it this far to this august university, um, I, I don't know why governments are hesitating to, to, uh, scholarship, uh, to offer uh, scholarships plus allowances. Uh, but for your information, my, my, my courageous government of Samoa has actually taken upon itself to uh, sponsor me partially for um, coming and but uh, the, the the fact is that the partial scholarship is going in the regular way. It doesn't take into account the the disability part of it. But I hope my prime minister will not uh, 
get angry at me and because I love him so much. We go to the same church together. He has seen, he has seen me read Braille in the scriptures um, every Sunday. And back home at Usenga Parish, the Holy Mother of the Rosary. So, and uh, Mrs. Susan Sella has been there and she's met my grandmother. Thank you, Mrs. Susan Sella. Um, um, uh, the, first, the first point about this scholarship is that it is pure and simple common sense to have uh, scholarships for students with disabilities regardless. And it is also pure and simple common sense to uh, what to say, to have a certain allowance set aside for extra expenses. No matter if the government does not know what these expenses are, but they can just write it in print, black and white, which I can't see, they can write it there and say money for extra expenses. Like what? Like recorder, like hearing aid, like a braille machine, like my lovely assistant, Auntie Sainiana Tukana, who is a great Olympian of Fiji and who is uh, here with us today. You know, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's like that. And uh, for me, as it is a starting point, I'm only pushing for having uh, allowances like fortnightly. I'm only pushing for 50 or $100 a fortnight at least. I'm not pushing for 100 million thousand, no. I'm only pushing for, for 50, 100 or even $20 a fortnight at least. Because I understand that it's the, first, it's the first time for governments, yes? First time for governments to actually, and they will say, oh, the risk is there, he's blind, he'll fail, what, 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 what. So, yes, that's the, that's the whole uh, uh, crux of the matter. And if we have these, uh, this scholarship that takes into account the disability with allowance, you also have to remember that the notion of independence for you guys is not the same as with us. I can say that truthfully because when, when we say independence, it means going away from our parents, our parents who are always worried about us left, right and center, and actually getting to stand up and go and, and pay for the taxi to go to church. Because we cannot, some of us cannot go by bus by ourselves, so we have to pay for the taxi. It, it means actually <coughs> Please, timekeeper, this uh, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not very well. Um, it means actually actually um, giving us allowance so that we can go and just be with our friends like anyone else. And we do, we do not want our parents or, or, or our families to throw, to throw things at us and tell us that we are a burden to them or that they are paying for this and that for us, for us. Already we have a disability. What other burdens do, are they talking about? So that's why it's, uh, it's very important to have uh, that. Yeah, I think that's all I have to say. But uh, I just want to uh, again extend my sincerest thanks to everyone for hearing because usually when you hear a person with disabilities all you think about is extra work extra time extra resources extra this extra that but uh, if you if you able-bodied persons try and nurture nurture us and try to bring out our potential in the different ways and if you're not sure ask us personally eh? Ask us personally. You can come, you can see me, you can see Edwin there. Edwin is from the Solomons. Edwin Babanisi, who is 38 years old and has three children, married, and has uh, been all over the world. And we also have Savita, who is from Lambasa, Lambasia. And, uh, and uh, we also have uh, our hearing impaired. I hope there's some hearing impaired here. And we also have Inais, who is our lovely 
interpreter in sign language. And uh, I hope Madam Rachel Imbulatale is here and uh, Madam Monica Robinson, Corey Robinson, as she likes to be called. Yeah, these are all the people that, uh, that we work with in the Disability Center and that the university has, has uh, provided for us since 2013. And for information, the only Itauke, um, Itauke person who graduated, uh, the, the first blind person who graduated in Itauke before, before having this DRC was uh, Mrs. Sisi Sovayado Lala Foktofon. Uh, who is now who is now married and uh, who has now completed her masters, and she graduated from this very august university. And you may say, well, Ari, so why are you complaining? Because Sisi came and she did everything without DRC and what 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 what. But I don't know. I'm not sure whether Sisi actually was able to tell you how she did it. Was actually able to tell you the challenges that she went through, like, like I'm doing now. So I hope that by telling you the challenges that we are going through, that they will be uh, uh, making a lot of changes. Faftai lava, soy Thank you. Thank Can I just ask the student panellists to all take a seat at the front, please, for the question and answer session. I'll just make a few comments myself first and then open the floor for discussion. Um, I think it's critical that universities um, respond to the student voice, and that was one of the reasons for this panel today, and I'd like to personally thank all of the students for a very rich uh, contribution they've made to the Learning and Teaching Forum. Uh, we're far better for, for that. Um, just a, a couple of comments about um, some of the uh, issues that were raised. Then, um, uh, I think just respond, responding initially to Ari's um, comment there, the, the VC has said that from 2016 then all the Thala-based courses will be video captured, including audio capture as well, and then posted on Moodle. So that will hopefully make quite a difference to both visual and hearing impaired people as well. Uh, I think the one thing that struck me about Ari and a number of the presentations was how much they engaged the audience. And so that uh, I think they led the way in terms of um, pedagogies, in terms of interacting. And also they're very innovative and creative use of the technology, so it's particularly impressive. But you don't want to hear me, uh, you want to ask some questions, so I'll open the floor if people want to raise their hand and then we'll take a microphone. And would you like to please specify who you are and uh, uh, specify which panellist you wish to answer your question? Thank you very much for taking the time to make such very good presentation. And uh, I think it's good, you know, uh, this is a forum where we can sit and see, you know, what we are doing well, especially from you, as Richard has said, and what we need to improve upon. And I wanted to make that comment to our ADs as well, because, you know, they have identified some gaps which we need to address. And that is the purpose of forums like this. This is a comment. And thank you, uh, Ari. When the first, uh, what's her name, uh, who graduated? Yes, Sissy. We had not gone to online then. So we went to such lengths to go to the School of Blind to help out. We were at loss too. But uh, we did buy a lot of software to help her, you know, 
uh, complete our program because we were learning then how we would be able to mainstream you know, people with disability. So it's a learning process for us as well at the university. And I'm glad that you've raised some of the things you know, that will alert us to be able to uh, um, you know, address in the programs that we offer and in our overall you know, mainstreaming disability, which has become a very important part at the university, particularly for the for Faculty of Arts, Law and Education, you're right. And, um, and no advertising, please. <laughs> No, because we've, we have a lot of students who, who come in there. But I was just wondering, you know, where, you know, the, uh, now you just said that the center has just started, where that link could be made more, you know, between the faculty so that we can get those kind of feedback, you know, to be better, in a better position to, to integrate. So, uh, you know, I just want to say that to, to you, Ari. Thank you for coming with, with those. And, uh, you know, allowances. I was just going to raise, uh, uh, Richard, where, you know, um, that's a good point about scholarships, because I know Fiji uh, does give, but not much, very limited number, and if we could address that, you know, do we have scholarships that we can give, you know, um, to students with disability. Well, I just want to, to I, I want to raise that question for the institution itself, if we can put that as something that has come up from this, uh, because the number is still small at the moment, and I think we really want to uh, uh, support that group. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, we just want the mic's been uh, moved, I'll just comment. Um, when I was on the Scholarships and Loans Board, there was from memory about a quarter of a million dollars allowance, but had some conditions on it, like it um, only applied to people who were living in disabled care facilities run by the government, which was a bit purely, and it wasn't all taken up either. Hi, this is addressing uh, Ari. Thank you for your comments about um, some of the struggles that you have with online learning. My name is Irene, I'm an instructional designer and next to me is uh, Rajneel, who is a developer. We're working on um, some of the APA uh, referencing and citation, and, and it's true that we have not uh, considered the audio uh, sections of specific, like comma, full stops, and so on. But since we're working on it right now, we will be uh, making sure that the audio components will be in those exercises. So thank you for giving it. Uh, giving that feedback to us. Thank you. Any other questions? Over here? Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sarita and I'm taking preliminary in geography and English. Uh, my question is uh, to Ari. Ari, do you think uh, USP can open disability resource centers to other regions like Samoa and uh, Vanuatu? Because uh, as a person from Vanuatu, it is hard to, for me to for me to leave my parents and you know at times come and live with my relatives where I face a lot of challenges, and it's hard for me to overcome them. You know, God. Uh, thank you. I don't know why all the questions are coming to me, first of all. Uh, but uh, this just shows how much the university has taken what I had to say to heart. And um, I just want to thank you. Not that the university is not taking what uh, all my fellow panelists have said to heart, because only God knows that. But uh, firstly, to answer Dr. Kendrayate's question, of course. Uh, Savita, you wait, eh? We'll talk with you. Um, <laughs> to engage more with the faculties. Well, to me, I mean, initially that's what I thought has been done from day one since the center has been established. And I know Madam Richelli would be in the best position to answer that. But from a, a person with disabilities point of view, maybe have uh, uh, yearly meetings or monthly meetings 
um, maybe not us, but, but uh, Madam Rachel and yourselves to... Uh, but then we also established a student advisory group that we call SAGA, since the university likes to use all sorts of names, and Fale is a name that we use in Samoa, meaning house. So, yes, SAGA, a student advisory group, disability. So, I think uh, we are, I was the chair chairman um, last semester, but due to unforeseen circumstances, I actually um, threw in the towel and told someone to take it, but at the moment, um, that hasn't been forthcoming, also due to other um, unforeseen circumstances and the time and everything like that, but we hope to, to get that up. And that body can also help in uh, sending feedback to the various faculties to uh, be able to, um, to be able to facilitate better learning. And I'm sure that uh, Dr. Kenrayate and all the other deans will appreciate that. Uh, um, I can perhaps briefly sec comment as oh, well um, in that the, uh, I'm working with the Disability Research Centre who's part of Campus Life and um, we're working on a plan to increase participation that will incorporate looking into what facilities are needed to do that as well. And then the other thing that is on the agenda is that the, some would be aware the university is moving forward um, quickly with the development of a major campus in Solomon Islands and, and um, we're conscious of disabled people in Solomon's Islands wanting to increase access to education for them, so that will be a feature of the development of that campus as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, the second question, Are Savitri, you know the answer, Are. The answer is yes. Disability centres can be established. You know why? Because attitudes will change. Eh? And I am a very good example of that because I, ha I had to complete my foundation level at Alafua campus. And at that time, there was no one with disability who went there. And I went there and there was one nice lady there. And uh, they said that this thing will be telecast to all the 12 countries. So I'm hoping that in my country some people are actually using the bandwidth to listen. There's a nice lady there. Her name is Sulgi Samuelu. And she's very nice, and she was actually uh, one of the first pioneer, no, the first pioneer to actually accommodate my needs at Alafua. My examination times, my e-copies of things, my printed copies of books that came late, and uh, that I cannot read, but I had to ask somewhere else, someone else to read. Uh, including Mrs. Seller's uh, HY, H, HYF, uh, yeah, H, yeah, yeah, the foundation course, uh, politics and, yeah, and, and, and history. Um, I did that through DFL. So, yes, and you also have uh, Mr. Tony Siamuamua, who is also the campus life um, officer, or whatever you call that. Yeah, that, uh, those posts are there. And if there is no disability center at the moment, what we can do is work with the people who are already there. Eh? Savitri, you work with the people already there, then perhaps uh, the disability center will come in time. Eh? Thank you. Any other questions? Any questions for the other panels? My name is Donna McKinnon. I'm from Guyana in the Caribbean. And I'm a master's student here at USD. Um, I'm picking up from the team of, of um, the learning and um, teaching forum. And it's striking that it says nurturing talents um, uh, for today and tomorrow. One of the things that I've noticed, when we're talking about nurturing talents, um, particularly here at the University of Sorry, can you South just move the microphone a bit closer? University we can't hear you. of the South Pacific, we're talking about talents of all our students, of course, including disabilities. As I said, I'm representing master's postgraduate student 
Um, but I have not noticed anybody dealing with issues that masters and postgraduate students have. Um, some of the issues are similar to undergraduates, etc. But there are other issues that we face that are unique to postgraduate students, which um, I believe that um, also needed to be addressed. Um, say, for instance, students who are doing research. How do we help to nurture students doing research? How, um, in terms of students' ability to um, areas that they would like to research, how do lecturers nurture those uh, ideas that they have into a research topic, into um, uh, a thesis? How do they nurture those things? Um, so, so do you have a question are, for the student panel? Is it? Not, it's a general question. It's, it's, I'm just saying that I've noticed we're talking about nurturing talents and we're talking about students, including all students, but yet I do not notice any representative from the postgraduate master's level. Um, okay, thank you. And so, yes, that's Maybe to Duane, um, we get employers who tell us that uh, our graduates are not doing this, are not doing that well enough when they um, let us know some of the skills that they lack. You are year three and you're about to finish and you're excited. You are, you are very excited. In, in your presentation, looking forward, thanking people that have nurtured you. Now that you are about to enter the work, the workplace, if you don't get a journal, uh, into journalism, because that's what you've been prepared for, suppose you don't get a job in journalism, has the university prepared you well enough to get into something else? And has the university prepared you well enough to participate effectively Picking up from Maria's um, um, slides, has the university prepared you well enough now that you're on the verge of graduating? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, that's incredibly relevant, and um, I'm happy to answer. Well, number one, I should probably point out the fact that journalism is a very difficult field to be in. It's uh, certainly not the, uh, it, it's one where you have to be passionate, you are overworked and underpaid, and uh, sometimes you, it can be a, quite a bit of a job hazard. Uh, if I don't get into that, have I been prepared is what you're asked. If I've been prepared to go into other fields. I can say with absolute uh, confidence that I am probably not the best person to ask that question to because journalism is a field whereby you network with people from other fields and they give you skills and talents that you're meant that actually portray you as someone who could be useful in say for example PR communications, information offices. Yeah? Um, it, 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 is a very, it is a very open field. It gives you an incredible amount of skills. At the same time, I also, I'm, I'm a double major student, not single. I also take, uh, I took a lot of um, research lessons from geography. I love it. Like I said, I was, I was my high school's top uh, uh, geography graduate right out, of, right out of high school. I've loved it since the day, since the day I first took it in Form 5. Uh, if I could, I would go into that field. If not, so, yes, um, have, have I been given the skills? Well, that really depends on each person. For me personally, uh, I came back from Tonga just about a month and a half ago. I was there representing USP uh, on behalf of a media team that was covering uh, the, the, the meeting where all of our Pacific meteorological directors were at. And they signed an important declaration which would eventually be taken on and uh, be referenced, hopefully, in the upcoming uh, Conference of Parties 21 in December this year in a really important climate change issue. I was there. I was the only university student there. This university gave me that opportunity, and I will never, ever devalue that in any way whatsoever. If it wasn't for this university, if it wasn't for this program that I was in, I wouldn't be there. While I was there, I've been, I've been taking part in workshops, meeting with other people, understanding their background, where they come from. I'm the only, I was the only journalist there with an academia background. Everyone else learned on the job. 
So if they could get into that, you know, they, they, they get into it from, from on-the-job training in-house, they, they were incredibly reluctant to speak to me at first. First day was very tough. Whoever I tried to talk to, they were all shy away because they felt that since I came from the academia background, I was somehow an enigma of some sort. I was some outlier. The truth is I'm no more human flesh and blood than any one of them. But what did this university give me? It gave me a safe zone where I can practice and nurture the skills, the ability to talk, the ability to meet people and talk to them at both an intellectual level and at the same time at a more grassroots level. I got that from here. And I said, I say this again, I will never devalue the experiences I've got here. But it was also due to um, my lecturer who pushed for me to apply. He was like, here's an opportunity, apply. He didn't do it for me, he just said, here it is, because it was up to me to apply. Like I said, it's not like it's entirely up to the established institute to deal with the problem. It has to come from us as well. Your will, your will, your determination. Nurturing talent for the day and tomorrow takes everyone, and that includes us. We have to do our part. Perfect. Good note to finish on. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to um, thank all of the student panel. I think it's been a really impressive performance. Thank you very much. It's now a break for afternoon tea, and then we'll reconvene for the last session, which is the case studies at, at 20 past three. Thank you.